Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Reformed Church. Why don't we stand and greet each other this morning? Wave, smile, do an elbow, shake a hand, whatever you're comfortable with. I have just a few announcements before we move on to prayers and joys and concerns. Uh, lots of stuff listed in your bulletin, so feel free to check it out for more details. But preschool is starting back here, and their back-to-school night is April 28th, and then uh, we will be full-fledged into preschool again. Men's Bible study Thursday night at Dave's Shed. Uh, Thursday's Treasures, this coming Thursday morning at 10 a.m., and it is fair-themed, and it says they're going to have fair celebrities and fair winners and fair food. And I know, I forgot to mention it last week, but I know we have at least one fair champion here in Mary, and uh, she won how many ribbons? Five ribbons for her. Three blue for her amazing painting. So yes. So I'm hoping. Are you going to be one of the fair celebrity winners here on Thursday? Oh, okay. The paintings will be here. No guarantees on Mary, but the award-winning paintings will be. That's Thursday at 10 a.m. If you've got questions, see Rhonda or Bonnie. Um, yes, we realized pretty quickly we sent out the wrong parts of the bulletin for next Sunday. Uh, Lorena sent an update on an email with the correction, but if you've got any questions um, and lost that email, just call Lorena and she can let you know. Grief Share starting up again on Wednesday night, September 4th. Uh, details in the bulletin. You can talk to Mary about that. And then our Sunday school kickoff is going to begin Sunday, September 15th, and we're going to be doing a lunch church that day as well. So uh, stay tuned for more details about when and all the uh, wares of that. There's a lot of details about Sunday school starting up on the back of the bulletin. Um, we're in need of some more assistance and teachers for Sunday school. That's got the uh, schedule for how most Sunday schools will go. Be sure you read through that. And uh, we wanted to point out, we haven't pointed it out in quite a while, um, one of the places Lois takes blankets to is the Joppa Ministry uh, that works with the homeless. Um, and she took twenty blanket or ten blankets to Joppa, twenty blankets uh, to blank, and uh, we just wanted you to update you for the next few Sundays. We'll probably give the children's message offerings to the blanket ministry again. Um, but uh, I don't know. If, do you want to share anything about Joppa, or you had a neat encounter with a guy who was going to prefer your blanket over the one he got? Do you want to share that? I'll give it to Lois. I didn't tell her. Put her on the spot. Um, Joppa has been um, remodeled, but it's over by um, Euclid, um, across from the driver license um, place. Um, so usually before I just buzz and someone would come and pick stuff up. So this time I had to go in, and so one guy opened the door for me because I had two bags. And then he told me his story. He's been um, homeless for a year, and some other details um, he gave me. And then two other guys came in, and they, because they have to buzz to get in, and, and but then someone comes to get them, like it's an appointment kind of situation. 
And so then we got to talking and they were, um, the one guy said, yeah, the last time we got a blanket, it was wool and it was itchy. And I said, well, these are fleece blankets. And so he was all excited. And uh, so they were, those three guys were very interesting. I mean, they just wanted to know what I was doing there. And I go, do you really need blankets and stuff? And so that's what I know about Jampa. Yeah. A lot of times we'll talk about doing the work or raising the money or making the blankets, but uh, it's a good reminder that those blankets are going to people who very much value them and need them. So, yeah, and adults, and adults and children, yes, both at Joppa. So, that's what we'll be doing with our, our children's message money for a while. Does anybody else have any business or announcements before we move on to prayer concerns? Oh, Karen. Youth to do to youth. youth. <laughs> Golly. Yeah, don't get me in trouble. Yeah, don't get me in trouble. So um, we are going to eventually be needing some more leaders. And uh, this coming year, you wouldn't have to be there all the time. Just stop in a few times, see what it's all about. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, Dave and I really did not want to do this a couple years ago, or at least I didn't want to. I thought I was too old, my kids had grown up, and I said I was kitted out. And um, come August, she still didn't have anybody two years ago. Dave and I said we would help out, and it has been way more of a blessing for us than I'm sure it is for the kids. But um, we have really enjoyed it, and uh, it would be really nice to have some younger youth leaders, because we are the senior citizen part of Senior High Youth. Um, so... Think about that. Uh, we would love to have you. If you just want to come check us out some night, see what it's all about, we'd love to have you, and maybe we can get you convinced to join. Dave, how many years do you have left in you? <laughs> one. One. <laughs> woof. Woof. Folks, we got to get in there. If you, if you have any interest at all, I know as a former youth leader, Andrew will tell you as a former youth leader, there are no bad volunteers if you're willing to go and sit and listen and talk to uh, youth that you are eligible because uh yeah they they they'll connect with anybody who's willing to connect with them so any other business or announcements prayer updates um jordan i don't think they're here this morning but jordan did have his uh second laser treatment on thursday and uh is healing up so we'll continue to pray for him um, there's a couple names in the bulletin that may not be familiar. Chris Kushat and her husband Todd, uh, she is uh, battling cancer. He is battling heart issues, and uh, they're letting all the churches know. They have set up a place at the Mindham's Barbershop here in town um, where you can drop off non-perishable food items. Um, they really want to support them at this time. Neither one's really able to work or do much of anything else. And if you have any non-perishable food items... Uh, please drop them off at Mendham's Barber Shop. Uh, Phyllis Munger, uh, again, continues to get uh, encouraging news from her doctors. They think the surgery removed everything they want to remove. And uh, she will begin immunotherapy treatments. And then I think it was every three months, uh, a check on the cancer um, to see, see if anything's changed. But we are definitely celebrating with Phyllis uh, in the coming weeks that she got such good news. Um, Carter, I don't know if Carter's here today. He leaves tomorrow. Carter Burns leaves tomorrow for boot camp. So we're going to be praying for Carter this morning um, and the whole Burns family. And then also uh, Al is going to start his therapy this coming Wednesday up at Mayo and uh, going to have every Monday therapy at 3.30 p.m. every Friday, therapy at 7 a.m., giving them leeway to come back home on the weekends if they want. But it's going to be a seven-week process finishing mid-October, so it's a lot of time on the road and a lot of time up at Mayo. So uh, we're going to pray for Al this morning, too, 
um, and bless he and Cheryl as they take off uh, to begin his treatment. Uh, the last thing I would ask, I think on my list, um, we continue to have a long names of folks battling cancer. Um, occasionally we'll have somebody either give us an update or say, you can remove them from the list. They're in remission or their treatment's over or whatnot. If you've got uh, a name on this list that you have an update or a removal for, just shoot us an email at the office. Um, I think one of the other things I forgot, Catherine Van Zee uh, turns 95 on Thursday, and Sandy's invited anybody and everybody who knows and loves Catherine, even if you don't know her and you're just a member of this church, she gets tickled pink when she gets birthday cards. We're doing a card shower for her this week. Um, you can get details from Sandy. Otherwise, we've put the address uh, in the emails this week. Any other... Oh, the last thing I'd mention, um, huge blessing this week. I know, I think she's here. Arlene Martis from Connecticut, right? Uh, was here. We had a service for her husband, uh, Rudy, this week. And Arlene is sisters to Donna Heisman and Jean Steenhook. And uh, he passed, it was in 2021, but his plot was here. And so we had a service at the cemetery this week. And so we'll be praying for them too. Um, Beautiful day, awesome family all the way around, and we're thankful to have you here with us this morning, Arlene. So, any other joys or concerns or prayer requests or updates that I'm unaware of? Oh, Trisha. Oh. So she's yeah, 28 years old with a three-year-old daughter, so this wow. asks for prayers for her grace. Grace. We will add grace to our list. Oh, that is tough. Thank you for letting us know. Other joys, concerns, prayer requests. Royce Abbott. So uh, we have praise. So last Thursday there was a special hearing about my grandson. He can say whatever he wants on Sunday mornings. Royce, we are so excited for you guys. And uh, I mentioned to Charity, it would be awesome, I think, if you let us know the first Sunday he's going to be here and maybe we could bring some treats and have a little party. He was so tickled at the community service that people already knew who he was here. And I think it'd be really fun to uh, welcome him on that first Sunday morning and uh, let him know we've been excitedly praying and waiting for him. So that is awesome, awesome news. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And let us know if you have other needs as well. New parents. At... You've got Noah, too. Noah can help. He's a good uncle. But whew, exciting, fun news. We're going we're gonna to open with prayer this morning. Instead of saving it for later, we've got enough big things to pray about. Would you join me in prayer? We'll, we'll do a few uh, now, and then we'll do a few after the, the sermon too. But God, we just want to thank you this morning for the amazing news that Peter is going to be able to come and stay with Royce and Charity and Noah. And God, we are, we are just praying all those final details are smoothed out. His reception here in Iowa can just be as glorious as we hope it is. God, you have heard our prayers for this. You have answered our prayers. We would pray that you would prepare him a loving home. We know he's got a loving family. We know he's got a church waiting for him, excited. God, we would pray that you 
prepare friends for him. You would prepare school for him. You would prepare all those things that he'll need when he gets here. Uh, and God, we know you'll be with him every step of the journey. God, hear our prayers also for Al and Cheryl as they head up this week to Mayo. God, we would pray that you would use these weeks of treatment to eliminate every spot of cancer that resides within him. God, we pray for safe traveling mercies as they head up and head back, that you would uh, watch over them, care for them, and uh, Lord, keep them positive and strong and patient in these upcoming weeks uh, as they spend so much time in Minnesota. God, hear our prayers this morning for new youth leaders. Lord, so often those who step forward are changed forever. So many people have gifts they are not even aware of that they can use to serve you as they work with youth. God, hear our prayers for Grace and Grace's family in the coming months as they are grieving, as their hearts are wrenched, as they know Grace's days are coming to an end. Lord, we would pray that you would just ease any pain or discomfort. We would pray for great rest for grace. We would pray that those doctors would be wrong and that there is much more life left to live. But in these moments, God, we will just trust that she is in your hands on the journey. God, hear our prayers for the Heismans and the Steenhooks and the Martis family. God, hear our prayers for Arlene as she shared with us the life of Rudy and his faith and love and the things that he found joy in. Hear our prayers for Jordan as we open worship this morning, for healing, continued recovery from his burns. Hear our prayers for Carter. Lord, we know his stomach and his parents' stomachs and hearts are probably filled with nerves about this change in life. But we would pray that you've already got men and women there to mentor him, support him, fellow service women and men that will be there to stand with him. God, we would pray these coming weeks of boot camp would go smoothly and swiftly and that it would be very rich and rewarding for Carter. God, hear our prayers for Chris and Todd. Hear our prayer that this community and the churches within it would surround them and help them through this time of medical trouble. Hear our prayers for Phyllis as we rejoice that her treatments and her surgery have gone well and we pray for her continued treatments going forward. God, continue to hear our prayers for Joanne as she recovers from her fall. For Luke as they prepare to move temporarily to Arizona for his treatments. For our students and our staff who are back to school and overwhelmed, both children and adults at all the new things and new people. God, we would pray that even on those days when things don't go smoothly, your spirit would keep peace and remind them that those at that school are a family like they would be if they were at home or at church. God, as we open in worship this morning, we take again a special moment to recognize that even though the world tells us things are chaotic and in turmoil, even though people from every side tell us we are close, to chaos, close to war, close to destruction. God, when we stop and remember your promises, when we stop and remember the blessings that we have in our lives, when we stop and remember that we are a people 
rich, rich, rich in love and spirit and support. God, we can see the truth that there is no power on this earth that can overcome your kingdom at work. God, be with us in worship this morning. Hear our hearts as we praise your name. Speak to our hearts through your scripture and your prayer and your music. We pray all this in your name and all of God's children said, Amen. Would you stand with me this morning as we open in worship with number 619? I love to tell the story. Children are invited forward this morning for the children's message. And I have misplaced our offering bucket. So I'm going to turn our crayon bucket into our offering bucket. If you've got any coins or dollars that you want to donate this morning, wave your hands in the air and the kids will come and grab them. Come on down. Come on down. Oh, Give a yo if you need to. Awesome, awesome. I know, I'm, I forgot the offering bucket, so we're going to use this this morning. Oh boy, oh my word. Now, was that given freely, or did you just rough somebody up to get all that? Whoa, whoa. And we are going to be donating for a few weeks at least to the blanket ministry. All right. Uh, well, I, I misplaced the other one, so I'll find it for next week. But. All right. I got a couple questions. First of all, who started school already? Aiden. 
Aiden. Anybody start Monday that hasn't started yet? You? Anybody out there starting Monday that hasn't started yet? I know the younger ones go, yay. Oh, there's a lot of hands out there for that. How was uh, the first day for those of you who had a first day? Not good? You're in, you don't like fifth grade. Well, we're not going to talk about teachers we like and don't like because we have a lot of, <laughs> a lot of friends here. I guarantee at the end of the year you will have at least a hopefully a slightly better opinion than you have on the first day. Here's a, here, I don't know if I've told this before, but when I was in kindergarten, one of my very first memories of ever being in kindergarten was we had to go down the hallway to get our milk drink in the afternoon. And we walked past the first grade class and they had a window in their door. And when I peeked through that window as we walked by, I saw the teacher, Mrs. Current, had a big clock in her hands and she was showing the kids how to, she was teaching them how to tell time. And I suddenly felt so nervous and sick to my stomach and thought to myself, I don't know how to tell time. I thought that is the hardest thing a kid has to learn how to do. I will never learn. And I worried for days and days and weeks and weeks until I was in first grade and they taught us how to tell time. And guess what? It took me a while, but I figured out how to tell time. I was worried about it and probably shouldn't have been worried about it because they do the best they can to try to get everybody at school to learn. And those teachers are pretty good at their jobs in teaching us and giving us what we need to know to take to the next year, to take to the next year, to take to the next year. Here's another question I have for you this morning. Look at this. What is this? A shoe. Does anybody here know how to tie a shoe? Boy, who do I pick? We'll go over here first. Can you tie my shoe? I want to see how you do it. Because this also took me weeks and maybe months to learn how to do when I was a kid. Oh, and she is so far doing it just like it's kind of hard with these dumb dresses. Oh, thank you. That's exactly, for those of you who didn't see it, she did it just like this. This is exactly how I do it. You cross it over, you make the bunny ear, you wrap it around, you pull the other bunny ear through, just like that. Does anybody else, though, know a different way to tie your shoes? I think I saw Via first. Do you know a different way to tie shoes? Okay, she's doing the cross. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's tight. Yep, there you go. There's a bunny ear. There's another bunny ear. Yeah, pulling it through. Oh, now see, that's, you've done an excellent job, but that's, that's the way. Does anybody know a different way? All right, Aiden, you try, give it a shot. Do you know a different way? I don't, I, my toes don't need to go purple, so you can just, yeah, that's plenty tight. All right, going around, going around. Oh, now see, we all know the same way, don't we? Does anybody know a different way? Different way? You know? Okay, go for it. Go for it. It's different when it's on somebody else's foot, isn't it? It's kind of hard. I should have had you put my shoe on to do it. No. No? <laughs> Is it trickier when it's somebody else's foot? Yeah. 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 That is a different way, but it might be too. Yeah, yeah. Well, watch this. So my boys had trouble learning the way I learned, so this is how somebody showed us to do it with them. They said, you make the bunny ear, you make the other bunny ear, and then you tie. I know, it blew my mind. And then you pull the bunny ears, and then you pull the bunny ears again. That's a double knot. It is, but look, because you didn't do that first crisscross, it just can come out almost as easy, just like that. Oh, that's what you're trying to make, because it was on somebody else's foot, probably. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what? I was so mad when I was a kid, because it took me so long to learn how to tie my shoe, that I told my parents, I'm not going to wear shoes with shoelaces. I'm just going to wear Velcro shoes for the rest of my life. And they laughed, just like that. And they said, you're going to want tied shoes someday. And I said, I'm never going to want tied shoes. I know, I still kind of think of why, but if you limit yourself to Velcro and slip-on shoes, there's a lot of shoes you can't wear, a lot of really cool shoes. Well, but see, here's the thing. 
the older I've gotten, the better I get at tying my shoes, and they hardly ever come untied. Kind of like... My dad knows how to tie his shoes. Yeah, he ties his boots. Your dad helps you. It's kind of like when we talk about what we learn from Jesus, what we learn in the Bible, what we learn in Sunday school. At first, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And we're going to read a Bible story today where some people hear what Jesus says, and they go, that doesn't make any sense to us. But then Jesus reminds them through his whole life on earth, this gets easier to understand. This will make more sense, but trust me as I teach you. So as school started, as Sunday school is about to start, we're going to say a prayer this morning, and we're going to thank God for all the teachers that we're going to have at church, at school, at home, at daycare. We're going to thank God that they are going to be so patient and teach us all the things we need to know, even when we're confused and frustrated, okay? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for all those teachers and grown-ups and friends at school. We thank you for all the Sunday school teachers, all the youth leaders, all the adult Sunday school teacher and Bible school teacher, Bible study teachers that we have. God, we know that sometimes when we learn new things, or even when we work on old things, it is tricky and frustrating and we can get impatient but god we remember that as we get older and older and older those things start to make more sense just like it gets easier to tie our shoes as we get older it gets easier to understand your love so god we would pray that you would give us lots of patience as we learn new things this year and we would pray that you would remind us that we're all on a long journey to learn how much you love us we pray this in your name, and all of God's children said, Amen. You can grab your colors and your color sheets and your suckers, and we'll sing you off. God is so good. God is so good. No, yeah. God is so good. He's so good to me. He cares for me. He cares for me. He cares for me. He's so good to me. Would you stand with me as we sing our second hymn together, number 596, Gentle Shepherd. First scripture today comes from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and we'll read it together as a congregation. This is one of the many, many times in scripture that somebody is faced with a challenge, and even though it seems over the top or insurmountable or scary or sad, they stop and they say, but you know what? God is God, and the God we serve is the greatest God you could ever serve, so I'm going to just trust in them. These two verses come from the beginning of Hannah's prayer, uh, when she dropped her son off into God's care to be raised as a priest to serve the Lord. Let's read from the book of 1 Samuel chapter 2, together. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. 
My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Giving up her child for who knows how long to know, do who knows what, to not live with her own son anymore. And yet she stops and she says, regardless of what's happening, I am on the path of God and our God is the greatest God. Our second scripture today comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 84, verses 10 through 12. 84, 10 through 12. We'll read this together as a congregation. Very familiar verses, often used uh, in pretty famous uh, praise songs and hymns. Let's read together. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Raise your hand. If you, I remember very specifically times my father and my mother taught me or worked with me trying to get me to tie my shoes. Does anybody, I won't ask you, but just raise your hand. Do you specifically have a memory of someone teaching you how to tie your shoes? Ooh, kind of more than I thought. I asked a few people this week and they were like, I can't remember, I was too young. But maybe that's what happens when you learn when you're like, 16 versus three. No, I learned, I bet I was four or five. Does anybody remember the first time someone taught them how to ride a bike? I, I do too, because I ended up bloody after my very first day because they showed me and then I took off way too fast, way too quick. But I still remember my dad teaching me. Who remembers the first time someone showed them I'm not going to ask you if you don't know how to do this, because I'm always shocked. The more people I find have never done this. Do you remember the person who taught you how to change a tire? How to fry an egg? How to do a load of laundry correctly? Oh. How about how to build a fire? The correct way, not just throw everything in a pile and light until, it, yeah. All of those things can be self-taught, but if you get the right person to guide you through it, it is much, much easier. I may not learn as quickly as somebody else, but the right teacher, the right guide, the right leader can still get me there, even if it's harder working with me than it would be with the person next to me. Our second scripture today comes from the book of John, or our third scripture, chapter 6, verses 56 through 69. Jesus is giving instructions, a sermon, guidance, wisdom to his disciples. So far, they've been following him around a lot and seeing him do amazing things, and occasionally he'll kind of take them and put them in the place to do amazing things. But his teachings start, get, start to get a little deeper and scarier and more difficult to not only understand, but to follow. Starting with verse 56, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. This was as shocking then as it would be 
to someone now who had no previous knowledge of Jesus to hear someone say, you're going to have to eat my flesh and drink my blood if you want eternal life. If you want to truly feel the full love of God. It was shocking to them. It's shocking still kind of to think about to people today. If you don't know that this is kind of the beginning of the lesson that's going to last all the way through to the Last Supper and beyond. We understand now that he was using a metaphor. He was saying, remember in the old days, God kept your ancestors alive by giving them food from heaven. How desperate they were to survive, to maintain their health, to maintain their farms, to maintain their livestock, to maintain their wealth. Well, there is something greater than all of that put together. And what I, the Son of God, am teaching you is that there is something more important than the physical realm of this earth, something that you're going to want more deeply than physical food and physical drink. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. That right there is a verse that I will probably struggle with my entire life. It is a verse that I do not share with people when I visit them in the hospital or when they are homebound because they are ill or after they have had a big surgery or before they've had a big surgery. To hear someone say, it's the spirit that gives you life. Your flesh counts for nothing. That doesn't mean a whole lot to somebody who's currently in deep, unsatisfying pain of life. Someone who's grieving a loss. Someone who's been told they don't have long to live. Someone who's been told either the disease or the treatment are going to eat away at you and give you incredible pain. But Jesus is looking at these people and saying, I just want you to know, I care about your spirit. I care about your soul. I care about your heart. All of these things of the world, including your flesh, are going to come second to what God truly loves about you. And in that moment, you can sense and we'll see some of those disciples start to go, this is going to be a bigger sacrifice than I thought it might be. I thought I could do this whole God and Jesus thing just in addition to my regular life. I wasn't aware that he's starting to talk about sacrifices that are much bigger than time and a few donations. He's telling me that this could cost me physically on earth. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. As I was reading about this scripture this week, one of the more insightful things I read was from uh, Charles Spurgeon, the pastor and theologian, where he said, if you go back to the bread and the drink, and you go back to the point where he says, remember when God gave that to your ancestors and it rained down from heaven or it sprung out of the rock. What God wants to give you, you can't get on your own. He's going to give you the food you need. He's going to give you the drink you need. And all you can do is decide whether or not to accept it. You can try to satisfy your soul on your own, but it's not going to equal what God has to offer. 
From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. They caught the drift that this was going to be way tougher, that these miracles that they were seeing, these healings, these sermons, as awesome as they were, they weren't willing to give up what they already had to go further. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. And then this is my favorite verse of the whole passage. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. All of the other people walked away. But Peter tells Jesus what the rest of them are thinking. You just told us that at some point in our lives, the things we can gain on our own will come to an end. When we think short term, making all the decisions for ourselves is obvious. But when we think long term, when we think eternity, you are the only game in town. There is no other God that's ever been shown to us that loves us so much they would shepherd us into this world, shepherd us through this world, and then literally shepherd us out of this world to be by the Father. Peter and the other disciples are the first ones who realize this is the best way to live. As scary as everything you're telling us sounds, when we think long-term into eternity, you are the only one who can guide us there. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I am reading yet another book about a guy who goes all over the world to dangerous places, and he is studying what people were like before there was recorded history. Not just what happened in North America after the first settlers came, but what happened in the hundreds of years before that. What about South America? What about Australia? What about the deepest parts of Africa? He goes to all these places and he's trying to desperately learn where humanity came from. And the funny thing is, everywhere he goes, he specifically mentions in the book, I had to find the right guide because some of these places are dangerous. And he even says, he was saying to one of his guides, I heard this is a dangerous place and a lot of people die. And the guide just kind of laughs and says, yeah. Those were the people who either didn't take a guide because they didn't think they needed one or they chose a bad one. What makes a good guide and what makes a bad guide? A bad guide is a guide who knows what to do in every single situation and promises you they can bring you out no problem. That's a bad guide. The good guide is the one who says, I can bring you through even when we don't know what to do next. Even when you feel lost, even when you feel out of control, even when there is no more trail or map, even when the weather goes bad, they have the knowledge and experience to say, if we keep going forward, we'll be okay. If you stay with me, I have been through all this before. We can make it through. I mentioned to Arlene at the service this week, we had a reading. Uh, her husband, Rudy, was a huge uh, train guy, worked for the railroad for 43 years. And uh, one of the things that was shared with me that we shared um, this week at his service out at Waveland uh, was an anonymous metaphor or story about riding a train that uh, one, of his, one of his sons added a little addendum to at the end. And I said, this metaphor is so amazing that I'm going to use it as often as possible going forward. And it's, it's not a deep thinker. It's not a, I hardly understand this. It just kind of puts 
life and faith and our journey into such simple terms. I'm just going to read a portion of it, but it goes like this. It's called The Train. At birth, we boarded a train and met our parents, and we believed they will always travel by our side. As time goes by, other people will board the train, and they will be significant. They will be our brothers and our sisters, our friends, and they will be our children. And there was a stop in the journey when boarding that train, and it was the love of our life. Eventually, at a distant station with just a flickering street lamp shining down to aid the slow descent of our parents, they stepped down from the train one last time. We will go the rest of this journey without them. Others, too, will step down over time and leave a permanent vacuum, a trace of memories that have since slipped away. Some, however, will go unnoticed that we don't realize they had gotten up from their aisle seat and left the car in silence. This train ride will be full of joys and sorrows, youthful fantasy and harsh reality, a ride with expectations both left lying in wait and gleefully surpassed. But the train's most lasting marks are its most simple. The eager hellos, the see you soon goodbyes, and the finality of until we meet again farewells. And then Marcus, one of the children, added this at the end. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you for riding alongside me, for being a passenger on my train, as I am honored to have been on yours. But alas, we will board again, embarking on another journey, another train ride of our lives together. I love that so much because it encapsulates so well that on this journey in life, we have those people that usher us in, those people we meet along the way. It's almost like teachers at school or Sunday school teachers or Bible study teachers or youth group leaders that in our lives from the day we're born until the day we die, we are kind of passed along from teacher to teacher, guide to guide. And that can be where some people stop. But what I loved about the ending with Marcus is he mentions that even though they are stepping off of this train, there is a whole other journey that comes next. That if your guides in life end the day you take your last breath, that is it. But if your guide in life is the greatest guide you could ask for, the one that can lead you through anything, even when you think you are at your most lost and in trouble. If you are willing to make the physical sacrifices to fulfill the soul, there is another guide that will not only carry you through this life, but be there to greet you when you board the next train as well. If you just Google the words, Scripture, greatest God, Scripture, whose God is as great as our God, Scripture, God is the best or awesome, you will see person after person like Hannah or Moses or David or the disciples like Peter reaching a point in their life where they have to stop and say, I don't know what comes next and it seems overwhelming and scary, but what God is as great as our God? What guide could we ever follow that is as good as the guide who ushers us into this world, walks with us every step through it, and then takes our hand on the other side and leads us to eternity? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we begin this year of school and college and Sunday school and youth group and programming, 
all set so that we can meet our next leaders and guides, our next teachers and mentors. God, we are so thankful for all of those who have accepted that call to lead children, to lead teachers, to lead staff, to lead students, because they know that they are the temporary guides along the journey of life. God, we thank you for those who will sacrifice time and heartache and patience and love to be able to continue to point those they work with to you. Reminding us where we came from and reminding us where we are headed. God, we would pray that in those moments in the coming days and years of our lives when things seem overwhelming and the teaching that your spirit is more powerful than our flesh and more important than anything of this earth, even on our most difficult days of grasping that God, may we just stop to remember you are the true God. There is no one more powerful, more intelligent, more loving. There is no one we could put our trust in greater than you. God, as we continue this prayer from this morning, Lord, hear the names of those that are in the midst of understanding that lesson. Allison, Michelle, Kathy, Marilyn, Lowell, Jerry, Wanda, Ron, Debbie, Kurt. Hear our prayers for Luke Wilson and his family. Hear our prayers for Grace and her family. Hear our prayers for all of those who silently hold on to the parts of their lives that they deem lost or hopeless. God, let us remember that you are the God who is so powerful you can even wipe our sin away. You are the only thing in this universe who can forgive so fully that our souls are washed clean. God, if there is anything that we have said or done or thought in the last weeks or months that we hang on to, things that pull on our hearts and make us lose sleep, Lord, we offer those sins to you now in a moment of prayer, knowing that you are the God who will not only clear those things from our hearts, but always welcome us back. God, we realize that some of the teachings of Jesus Christ seem so difficult and painful, even though they are meant to bring us more fully into your love. But God, we also remember there were many simple teachings, many comforts he gave to our hearts and our minds that we can remember daily. Let us close this prayer with those words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy Amen. Would you stand to receive your benediction this morning and then we will with our last hymn together, hymn number 574, Revive Us Again. As you leave this house of worship today, I would remind you 
to not just hold on to it, but to spread it to those you meet who need to hear it. What God is as great as our God that not only does he bring us to this life, not only does he walk us through this life, he is the same God who will carry us into the next as well. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.